everyone. I'm Karen Catlin, and I am an advocate for women who are working across the tech industry. And this is actually my second career. In my first career, I spent about 25 years building software products. I started out as a software engineer right out of college with my computer science degree, and over time moved into people management and program management, and then to executive leadership. And I was a vice president of engineering at Macromedia, if people remember that company, and Adobe Systems as well. And I'm now in my second career. And I'm an advocate for women because I care about helping women be successful across the tech industry. And as an advocate for women, I'm a leadership coach. And I coach mostly women, although I also coach some men on ally skills and how to be better allies for women. And I've been doing this for about five years. And in those five years, I think I've coached almost 300 people at this point. And as you can imagine, I see some themes emerge in my coaching. One of these themes is influence. My clients come to me and they want to get better at influencing without authority. Not telling their team what to get done, but how to influence up and out to be successful. And when I ask my clients, okay, let's, let's explore like one of the most recent things you've had to do or you've had to influence, let's talk about that. I'll hear, well, I had an idea and I went to the stakeholder meeting, I pitched my idea and I was not successful. And then I say, well, who did you meet with ahead of time to build support? Did you have any pre-meetings? And I often get these quizzical looks. It's like the pre-meeting is this secret weapon that no one knows to use. Um, about two days ago, as I was working on this talk, I actually decided I needed to change the title of my talk. So this talk is not about the art of the pre-meeting. It's actually pre-meetings, a secret weapon for new managers. And I'm thrilled to be here today. Now, I think I first kind of understood the power of this secret weapon many years ago when I was reading a book in a book club. And the book we read was Endurance, William Shackleton, excuse me, Ernest Shackleton's incredible journey and voyage to the Antarctic. To show of hands, are people familiar with Shackleton's story? I have a feeling, yeah, quite a few of you. In this book and the real life story of Shackleton, in the early 1900s, he decided, he was an explorer, an adventurer, he decided he wanted to go to the Antarctic, cross the Antarctic via the South Pole. So in England, where he lived, he started raising capital, and he got enough capital in place to acquire his boat, his ship, the Endurance, and hire a crew, and fill it with all the provisions they were going to need for this journey. And they set sail in 1914 to go to the Antarctic. Now, they got to the Antarctic, but not to the place he wanted to get to. And his ship, the Endurance, got stuck in the ice prematurely before he reached the landfall he was looking for. And the men and Shackleton lived on the Endurance for a number of months during the winter. They had to wait it out till um, the summer came so that the ship would be released from the ice. So they started living on this boat, and then eventually the ship started to sink. So they had to move onto the ice flows, and they moved all of their provisions, their sleds, their dogs, everything they needed to survive. And so began a two-year journey of survival, where Shackleton led, and spoiler alert, he got everybody out safely, but it took him two years of living on that ice and um, so forth to get to safety. And he didn't have enough provisions for two years, so they had to start hunting to survive. And on the ice flows in Antarctica, the best thing to hunt was seal. So the men would go out and hunt seal every day. And there was a problem with hunting seal because seal hunting was dangerous and hard work and the seal meat actually didn't taste very good either. So anyway, this was not a sustainable solution. And at one point, Shackleton realized how unsustainable it was because he started looking at how much seal meat they were consuming. Now a seal would last three men one day. Okay, so one seal, three men. But these sled dogs you see in this picture, they were consuming three seals a day. So at some point, Shackleton made this tough decision in his mind of, we gotta kill the sled dogs, this is not sustainable. And then he started meeting with his crew in small groups by campfire, and started talking about how much seal meat the dogs were consuming, how this was hard work, not sustainable, and so forth. So that after a couple of weeks of doing this, 
he then made the decision, we have to kill the sled dogs. And the men kind of got it. They knew it was coming. They supported it, even though they didn't like the decision, because these dogs were their, you know, their pets. And so he did not have a mutiny on his hand. Now, fast forward over 100 years from Antarctica to today's tech industry. And are pre-meetings still a thing? Well, I was talking about a month ago with one of my coaching clients about this talk. And I was talking to her about pre-meetings and asked her that question, do you still think they're a thing? And she said, pre-meetings, hell yes, they exist. Everyone is doing them. And no one tells them about you, about them when you're a new manager. And some of you may know my coaching client, Tammy Buteau, who's a Dropbox engineering manager. So we're going to talk about the secret weapon that is the pre-meeting, right? And I need all of you to come with me on a little bit of a mindset shift. And we've heard about this in different areas um, throughout the talks today. But this mindset shift of what got you to this point in your career is not going to get you here. What got you here with your great like coding and debugging and technical skills and made you a great engineering manager is not necessarily what's going to make you a great engineering leader. Excuse me, engineer, engineering leader. So what got you here ain't going to get you there. And a case in point, I had another coaching client. Um, we'll call her May. And May was a security engineer, a really good security engineer. And her manager was promoted or transferred somewhere in the organization. And then May was promoted to run the team, to run the secure software engineering team. And in addition to her responsibilities of running the team, you know, prioritizing work, doing performance management, doing some hiring, she also had to influence up and out. She had to convince engineering managers across the company to fix security bugs in their code. right? So she relied on the skills that made her successful as an engineer. She ended up building a tool to send out reminders every day to those engineering managers of their open security bugs. And let's just say that was not really effective. So what got us here ain't going to get us there. And what May and pretty much every engineering, new engineering manager needs to embrace is this mindset shift of, I'm going to be in more meetings. I'm going to be more in more meetings to convince people of what to do, to influence them, and to get them on board with what I need to get done. And whether those meetings are around a conference room table like this or virtual, it doesn't really matter. Now, some of you may be thinking, but wait a second. This kind of feels manipulative. It feels kind of political to kind of have to go around and talk to people and convince them it's the right thing to do because, after all, they should just be knowing that they should fix their bugs that are security-related or support this great idea for a new process or a technology or a feature that I'm pitching, right? People should just get it. It's the right thing to do. But here's the thing. It's not manipulative at all because we all love to be part of sort of an inner circle, right? The inner circle where we're hearing about problems and maybe being asked our opinions and brainstorming on ideas and so forth. So people, we're actually fulfilling a connection that people want to have when we meet with them ahead of time and have these pre-meetings. So it's not manipulative at all. I kind of think it's more just evolved and meeting a basic human need. So let's now move on to talk about some, I'm going to talk about some scenarios that happen with pre-meetings and some missteps people make as well as some pro tips to counteract those. So Let's use um, a different example here from another coaching client. Um, we'll call him Dave. And I choose Dave just because it's probably the most popular name for people in engineering right now. Um, so Dave, Dave ran the internal the tools team for his company. So the tools that all the engineering teams were using. And that was his team's responsibility. And at one point, Dave realized, wait, we've got like nine engineering teams. And I think they're using three or four IDEs across the teams. There's no standardization. And that's a lot of work for my team, because I have to manage the integrations with all the other tools, with all these different IDEs. So I want to standardize on just one IDE. And Dave knew that to influence up and out, he didn't just have to influence his manager and convince his manager that this one IDE would be the right solution. He had to go to the Council of Architects at his company. And so the Council of Architects met on a regular basis. He got on their agenda for an upcoming meeting and went in and pitched his idea. Well, Dave got the thumbs down. He got the thumbs down when he pitched the idea of standardizing on one IDE because he hadn't socialized the idea ahead of time. And maybe Dave had not done a good job in that meeting of bringing people along on the journey of what the situation was and what the problem was and what the solution was going to be. 
But maybe those architects were thinking as they heard about standardizing one IDE is like, Ugh, yeah, maybe it sounds like a good idea, but this is going to be a lot of work for me, and I have to go back to my team and convince them that this is the right thing to do, and it's going to take away from feature work, and it's going to be just a hassle, and I don't even know why we're doing this, and I don't, so I'm going to give it the thumbs down, right? So we really need to think about socializing the idea, and the pro tip here is, of course, build support ahead of time. Now, what Dave, and I, as I was talking with him, what Dave started saying is like, yeah, Karen, I get it, and I should socialize the idea ahead of time, but that's why they have the meeting is so I can just go and pitch to all of them at once. I don't have time to go meet with 12 different architects and tell them about my idea before the meeting, right? Well, this is actually another misstep. It's just assuming they're going to be too busy to meet with you, so you never even try, um, and assuming yourself being too busy. So, and I get it. We have, a lot of us have calendar whiteout where we're just back to back to back meetings in our calendar and it is hard to make time to do some of these things. So pro tip number two is target just a few key stakeholders as you think about who you're going to meet with ahead of time. Not all 12 of those architects or whatever the council is that you have to convince, but target just a few people who will provide you with a lot of support in that meeting. And I emphasize here, don't forget the curmudgeons. I think every group has a curmudgeon or two, you know, those people who are like kind of poke holes at any new idea that comes up because um, they're smarter than you and they just are kind of ornery. But you really want to be meeting with these curmudgeons even though the meeting's going to be incredibly uncomfortable because they're the ones you do want to have poke holes in your idea so that you understand a little bit more about how other people might react, right? So even though it's uncomfortable, don't forget the curmudgeons. So now Dave's thinking, okay, Karen, and we're talking about it. It's like, okay, I can talk to just a few key stakeholders. I'll, there is a curmudgeon. I know who I should talk to. And I'll get their support before the meeting. Um, so I'll, I'll meet with them. I'll get their support. So here's misstep number three, is that Dave went into those pre-meetings thinking that, okay, I got to convince them that one ID is the right thing to do because my idea is brilliant, right? So I'm going to go convince them. Well, Again, get, getting back to that inner circle, like people want to be involved with solutions, not just hear what's going to happen. So the pro tip here is listen to them. Don't go in with a whole baked, you know, fully baked proposal, but perhaps an idea of where you want to go, a direction, the basics of what you want to achieve. And listen to their feedback. Ask questions. What do you expect it would be the reaction to this? How is what I'm doing help, going to help you be successful hitting your OKRs or goals? What's the reaction to your team going to be? You know, ask questions. And I mentioned here, listen so they are heard. And what I mean by this is, you know, I think probably many of you have heard about active listening techniques so that you really are hearing people. Um, just two quick notes on what this might look like. One is people love it when you take notes of the things they're saying, right? Because you're listening to them and you're taking the time to actually say, that was a good point and I'm going to write it down. The other is, of course, repeating back to the other person what you heard, like in your own words. So, you know, I heard you say this, this is your concern about this IDE, and I need to accommodate that feedback or whatever that looks like. Um, and of course, before these meetings, you have to sort of coach yourself, of like, I'm not going to get defensive because when we have a brilliant idea and we open it up to feedback, it can be a moment that we're going to feel defensive. So kind of try to check that um, behind when you are going into these meetings. So now Dave's thinking, okay, I get it. I'm going to set up those meetings with a few key stakeholders and the curmudgeon. I'm going to listen so they're heard. I'll ask a lot of questions, and then I'm going to get a lot of feedback. And then misstep number four, which is feeling obliged to take it all. You don't have to take all the feedback. This is the thing. They, people will give you a lot of feedback if you open yourself up. And there's also going to be this feedback, which I like to call the while we're at it feedback. While we're at it is, it looks like, you know, in this case with the IDE, it's like, well, while we're at it and we're replacing the IDE and standardizing on one, why don't we also standardize these three other tools that are kind of being, you know, kind of used all over the place in our company? While we're at it, let's keep doing this. While we're at it, just layer on additional requirements. And guess what? I think this is usually a stalling technique. Because the person giving you that feedback doesn't want to do this IDE work or whatever the project is, and they're going to layer on these additional requirements to ensure that you will never get approval and get it off the ground, right? So, um, so the pro tip here is you have to trust your gut when you're taking the feedback. You don't have to take it all. You are not ceding control of the design of your process or your tool or your feature to other people. You're simply trying to make it better. And 
With trusting your gut also, you have to remember that your company has hired you to do a job. And it might be at odds with other people's jobs around the company, but that doesn't mean that your job is less important than other people. Um, back to May, the security manager, you know, she was chartered with making sure the software across the company was secure. And maybe the other engineering managers were chartered with earning a lot of revenue or growth around their product, right? So she had to figure out how to own her job, do the job she was hired to do, and trust her gut about what feedback to take. And a big part of trusting your gut is also as you're making decisions like, I'm going to ignore that piece of feedback, is circle back with the person who gave it to you so that, again, you tell them, I heard you, I'm not going to do it right now. I heard you that you want to standardize those three other tools in our tooling chest, but that's going to be phase two because we're going to focus just on the IDE right now. Okay, so circle back with people. All right, so now Dave and I are having this conversation. It's like, okay, I'm going to talk to some key stakeholders. I'm going to listen to some herd. I'm going to trust my gut and only take the feedback that makes sense. And then when we go into the big meeting, the architect meeting, that they will actually, you know, trust, excuse me, they will actually support me and my idea will get approved. Well, that's misstep number five, in that you assume people are actually going to remember the conversations you had. And here's the thing. We, especially the more senior you get, your context switching all day long, going from meeting to meeting to meeting. And it's not that these people who forget what they talked about with you are stupid. It's just that they've got so much com maybe competing information that they're struggling with or that they're processing. And they may not, not remember the conversations around, here's what you originally proposed, here's how you're modifying it to meet their needs, here's how it's going to help them be successful, here's the support I'm counting on from you in the big meeting, right? So pro tip number five, and I learned this from one of my clients who literally does a huddle before a big meeting. And she gets her, her little circle, the people that are her stakeholders that she's had the pre-meetings with, she gets them in a, literally in a circle before the meeting and goes through the game plan. I'm going to be pitching this idea. Here's how it's going to help your team be successful or be um, net positive for the company. And here's the support I'm counting on from you, okay? And then they go into the meeting. Now, of course, if you can't actually get the people together in a circle before going into the meeting, you can do it on a phone call ahead of time, a quick Slack message, doesn't matter what it is, but remind people of the support you're counting on for them so that you're successful. Now, it's time to wrap this up. And while I hope none of you have to do anything as hard as influencing other people that it's a good decision to kill the sled dogs, I certainly hope that you will, the next time you do have to make an influential decision and influence others that you can channel this inner Shackleton a little bit and embrace this secret weapon that is the pre-meeting. And one last thing. So I've co-authored a book. Co-authored a book. There we go. It's called Present, a Techie's Guide to Public Speaking. And this book is pretty much sort of a soup to nuts kind of experience of how to up your public speaking skills and why you want to be doing more of it. And it also has a whole bonus chapter on applying all of these techniques for public speaking, like being on a stage like this, in a meeting in our tech industry. And so while I want all of you to embrace this secret weapon that is the pre-meeting, I also want all of you to get better and up your game in pitching in meetings, for example, and potentially being on stage at next year's Calibrate. So my co-author, Pornima Vijay Shankar, and I want all of you to have a free copy of our book. So you can take a picture of this download link. It's also in your programs if you um, have one of those. And you can go to this link and you can download a free copy of either the ebook or the Audible version. As I said, free of charge, our, our compliments. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. <laughs>